Stroud. All right, this is the Rex check-in call on Wednesday, April 14th, 2021. In any normal year, everybody would be working on their taxes last minute because tomorrow would normally be tax day. But hey, all bets are off. All deadlines have shifted. The world is different. No, but you still got to pay the IRS. That's true. You still got to pay the IRS. That's true. Uh, The IRS doesn't seem to mind pandemics and stuff like that. So. So I would like to read, if you will bear with me, a poem called Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude by Ross Gay. And it goes like this. Friends, will you bear with me today? For I have awakened from a dream in which a robin made with its shabby wings a kind of veil behind which it shimmied and stomped something from the south of Spain, its breast a flare looking me dead in the eye from the branch that grew into my window coochie cooing my chin, the bird shuffling its little talons left, then right while the leaves bristled against the plaster wall, two of them drifting onto my blanket while the bird opened and closed its wings like a matador, giving up on murder, jutting its beak, turning a circle and flashing again the ruddy bombast of its breast, by which I knew upon waking it was telling me in no uncertain terms to bellow forth the tubas and sousaphones, the whole rusty brass band of gratitude not quite dormant in my belly. It said so in a human voice, bellow forth, and who among us could ignore such odd and precise counsel? Hear ye, hear ye, I am here to holler that I have hauled tons, by which I don't mean lots, I mean tons of cow shit, and stood ankle deep in swales of maggots swirling the spent beer grains the brewery man was good enough to dump off, holding his nose, for they smell very bad. But, made the compo- but make the compost writhe giddy and lick its lips, twirling dung with my pitchfork again and again with hundreds and hundreds of other people, we dreamt an orchard this way, furrowing our brows and hauling our wheelbarrows and sweating through our shirts. And two years later, there was a party at which trees were sunk into the well-fed earth, one of which, a Liberty apple, after being watered in, was tamped by a baby, barefoot with a bow hanging in her hair, biting her lip in her joyous work. And friends, this is the realest place I know. It makes me squirm like a worm, I am so grateful. You could ride your bike there or roller skate or catch the bus. There is a fence and a gate twisted by hand. There is a fig tree taller than you in Indiana that will make you gasp. It might make you want to stay alive even. Thank you. And thank you for not taking my pal when the engine of his mind dragged him into to swig fistfuls of Xanax and a bottle or two of booze. And thank you for taking my father a few years after his own father went down. Thank you, mercy, mercy. Thank you for not smoking meth with your mother. Oh, thank you, thank you for leaving and for coming back. And thank you for what inside my friend's love bursts like a throng of roadside goldenrod gleaming into the world, likely hauling a shovel with her, like one named Errolie Ott with hands big as a horse's. And who, like one named Errolie Ott, will laugh time to time till the juice runs from her nose. Oh, thank you for the way a small thing's wail makes the milk or what once was milk in us gather into horses, huckle buckling across a field. And thank you friends when last spring the hyacinth bells rang and the crocuses flaunted their upturned skirts and a quiet roved the beehive, which when I entered were snug two or three dead fist-sized clutches of bees between the frames, almost clinging to one another this one's tiny head pushed into another's tiny wing, one's forelegs resting on another's face, the translucent paper of their wings fluttering beneath my breath, and when a few dropped to the frames beneath, honey, and after falling down to cry, everything's glacial shine. And thank you, too, and thanks for the corduroy pouch I have put you on. Put your feet up. Here's a light blanket, a pillow, dear one, for I can feel this is going to be long. I can't stop my gratitude, which includes, dear reader, you for staying here with me, for moving your lips just so as I speak. Here is a cup of tea. I have spooned honey into it. And thank you, the tiny bee's shadow, perusing these words as I write them, and the way my love talks quietly when in the hive. So quietly, in fact, you cannot hear her, but only notice barely her lips moving in conversation. Thank you what does not scare her in me, but makes her reach my way. Thank you, the love she is, which hurts sometimes, and the time she misremembered elephants in one of my poems, which, oh, here they come, garlanded with morning glory and wisteria blooms, 
trombones all the way down to the river. Thank you, the quiet in which the river bends around the elephant's solemn trunk, polishing stones, floating on its gentle back, the flock of geese flying overhead. And to the quick and gentle flocking of men to the old lady falling down on the corner of Fairmount and 18th, holding patiently with the softest parts of their hands, her cane and purple hat, gathering for her the contents of her purse and touching her shoulder and elbow. Thank you, the cockeyed court on which in a half court three by three versus three, we old heads made of some runny nosed kids a shambles and the 61 year old after flipping a reverse layup off a backdoor cut from my no look pass to seal the game, ripped off his shirt and threw punches at the gods and hollered at the kids to admire the pacemaker's scar grinning across his chest. Thank you, the glad accordions wheeze in the chest Thank you, the bagpipes. Thank you for the, to the woman barefoot in a gaudy dress for stopping her car in the middle of the road and the tractor trailer behind her and the van behind it whisking a turtle off the road. Thank you, God of gaudy. Thank you, paisley panties. Thank you, the organ up my dress. Thank you, the sheer dress you wore kneeling in my dream at the crick's edge and the light swimming through it, the coy kissing halos into the glassy air the room in my mind with the blinds drawn where we nearly injure each other, crawling into the shawl of the other's body. Thank you for saying it plain. Fuck each other dumb. And you again, you, for the true kindness it has been for you to remain awake with me like this, nodding time to time and making that noise which I take to mean yes, or I understand, or please go on but not too long, or why are you spitting so much, or easy tiger, hands to yourself. I am excitable. I'm sorry. I am grateful. I just want us to be friends now forever. Take this bowl of blackberries from the garden. The sun has made them warm. I picked them just for you. I promise I will try to stay on my side of the couch. And thank you for the baggie of dreadlocks I found in a drawer while washing and folding the clothes of our murdered friend. The photo in which his arms slung around the sign to the trail of silences. Thank you the way before he died, he held his hands open to us for coming back in a waft of incense or in the shape of a boy in another city looking from between his mother's legs or disappearing into the stacks after brushing by. For moseying back in dreams, where seeing us lost and scared, he put his hands on our shoulders and pointed us to the temple across town. And thank you to the man all night long hosing a mist on his early bloomed peach tree so that the hard frost not waste the crop the ice in his beard and the ghosts lifting from him when the warming sun told him, sleep now. Thank you, the ancestor who loved you before she knew you by smuggling seeds into her braid for the long journey, who loved you before he knew you by putting a walnut tree in the ground, who loved you before she knew you by not slaughtering the land. Thank you, who did not bulldoze the ancient grove of dates and olives who sailed his keys into the ocean and walked softly home, who did not fire, who did not plunge the head into the toilet, who said, stop, don't do that, who lifted some broken someone up, volunteered the way a plant birthed of the reseeding plant is called a volunteer, like the plum tree that marched beside the raised bed in my garden, like the arugula that marched itself between the blueberries, nary a bayonet, nary an army, nary a nation, which usage of the word volunteer, familiar to gardeners, the wide world, made my pal shout, oh, and dance and plunge his knuckles into the lush soil before gobbling two strawberries and digging a song from his guitar made of wood from a tree someone planted. Thank you. Thank you, Zinnia and Gooseberry, Rudbeckia and Paw Paw, Ashmead's Colonel, Coxcomb and Scarlet Runner, Feverfew and Lemon Balm, Thank you, Knitbone and Sweetgrass and Sunchoke and False Indigo, whose petals stammered apart by bumblebees. Good Lord, please give me a minute. And Moonglow and Catkin and Crookneck and Painted Tongue and Seed Pop and Johnny Jump Up. Thank you, what in us rackets glad, what glad rackets us. And thank you to this knuckleheaded heart, this pelican heart, this gap-toothed heart flinging open its gaudy maw to the sky, Oh, clumsy, oh, bumble fucked, oh, giddy, oh, dumbstruck, oh, rickshaw, oh, goat twisting its head from me at meat from my peach tree's highest branch, ballast, balanced impossibly, gobbling the last fruit, its tongue working like an engine, a lone sweet drop tumbling by some miracle into my mouth, like the smell of someone I've loved, heart like an elephant screaming at the bones of its dead, 
heart like the lady on the bus, dressed head to toe in gold, the sun shivering her shiny boots, singing Erica Badu to herself, leaning her head against the window. And thank you, the way my father one time came back in a dream, by plucking the two cables beneath my chin like a bass, bass fiddle string, and played me until I woke singing, no kidding, singing, smiling, thank you, thank you, stumbling into the garden where the Juneberry's flowers had burst open, like the bells of French horns, the lily my mother and I planted oozed into the air, the bazillion ants labored in their earthen workshops below, the collard greens waved in the wind, like the sails of ships and the wasps swam in the mint bloom's viscous swill. And you, again, for hanging tight, dear friend. I know I can be long-winded sometimes. I want so badly to rub the sponge of gratitude over every last thing, including you, which Yes, awkward, the suds in your ear and armpit, the little sparkling gems slipping into your eye. Soon it will be over, which is precisely what the child in my dream said, holding my hand, pointing at the roiling sea and the sky, hurtling our way like so many buffalo who said, it's much worse than we think and sooner. To whom I said, no, duh, child, in my dreams. What do you think this singing and shuddering is? What this screaming and reaching and dancing and crying is other than loving what every second goes away. Goodbye, I mean to say, and thank you every day. So I barely, barely made it through that when I read it to April, like a few weeks back. <clears throat> Thank you, Bert. Hey, Susan. Hi, Susan. You're muted. It's all right. Zoom newbie. <laughs> no, not even, not even close. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, this. a lot of this online technology you should look into. Yeah. <laughs> should learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, yeah. Really, it's really powerful. You wouldn't believe the stuff people get up to inside of it. Even dumb, even dumb Nazis know how to use it. Yeah. <laughs> well. <clears throat> so let's catch up. Since Peter's, <clears throat> we haven't seen Peter in a long time. Peter, tell us what's up. Yeah, Peter. Uh, I'm still doing my, uh, my art practice. So uh, with COVID Academy, the Art Academy in Ghent is not closed, but it is so restricted that it's not fun anymore. Mm -hmm. going. And as I have my, my studio here, I mean, I have plenty of other things I can, I can experiment with. So these days, you don't see much behind me, but the only thing that is uh, keeping me busy from an artistic point of view is what is on the, on the drawing table. It's, uh, I mean, I'm drawing bricks. It's a present uh, type of experience. I'm preparing a blog on it, like uh, Zen and the art of drawing bricks. Uh, nice. So, I thought it was just your white period behind you. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I have a painting that is completely white on white. Well, well that, Malievich is famous white on white. Yes, and black. And there is this, um, I always forget the name. It's in, I think he's Italian who is a uh, highly repetitive work, who is, um, I can find it back. But... So what he's doing, he's um, just writing numbers. One, two, three, four. And I think he ended up with uh, 1,900,000 and so on, and then he died. Whoa. Something like that. So he has 180 paintings like that, starting with one and ending with, and they're about, one meter half on one meter, like size. Um, so, and this was inspired by a chat I had. Uh, Roman Opauka? Yeah, yeah. I just Google him, so I'll put him in the chat. Yeah. Wow, I ne never heard about him. Sorry, go ahead, Peter. Opauka, yeah, yeah. Um, so somebody mentioned to me when I was telling this story, you have to look at the work of the, the wife of Ai Weiwei, 
And she is called, let me find it back, because I put it in the blog that I'm preparing. I is, uh, oh, I don't know her wife's, wife's name. Let's look him up in Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> She's not very public about it. Yeah. I mean, she, she's um, uh, Lu King. Yeah, Lu King. And one of the works that she made was basically also highly repetitive work, but on a long roll of silk paper of 20 meters long, 20 meters long, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and one meter wide, all little blocks. So I have started a roll of paper of about five meters long and one meter wide. And it has all small bricks that are drawn by hands. Um, they're about this big, like a centimeter big. And they're all drawn in pattern. So there are many brick patterns, but the pattern that I'm using, using is the monk pattern. Mm. They're called runs, I believe. Runs? Okay. Yeah, when you lay bricks, it's called a run, and there are many different mm -hmm. traditional patterns for brick laying. So sometimes, you, sometimes the brick is facing in and out, sometimes they're rippled, but I believe they're called runs. Uh -huh. Good, I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, and in Lymington, England, there is a wall of bricks that is that undulates. Yeah. yeah. And people walk by and they run their hands over it. Uh -huh. Yeah. So Are I've your started bricks have color. Excuse Are your bricks me? colored? Uh, not these ones. It's a black Chinese ink on white paper. Mm -hmm. With a rapidograph pen of 0 0.7 millimeters. <laughs> it's always the same. Mm -hmm. And I started playing around with this concept also in a 3D software. Uh, I probably can show it, but uh, it's going to divert us too much. So I'm in bricks and I'm going to write a lot about it. And um, since December last year, I'm officially retired from corporate life. Um, and, but I'm still doing some freelance work. Uh, and I'm, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm still doing some freelance work, which is usually in um, what somebody called, I mean, I didn't suggest that, but they call it what you are doing, Peter, is premium curation. So you are, you have this skill that you can connect dots that nobody else connects with. The invisible dots. Yeah, uh, um, <laughs> that sounded or, like quite the side. Or it has to do with uh, so the one project I'm on, and I cannot say who it, who it is for, but uh, they basically want to have um, a thinking experience event, something. Is it because you're not allowed to say the name of God? I, I, it's, it is God. Yeah, I, I'm not allowed to say it. Um, That's tough, though. Like you can't put that on your website. No, I can't. Um, so that's skipping. I'm reading quite a lot. I'm still very, very deep in the work of Anne Pendleton and John C.D. Brown. So thank you for that connection, uh, uh, Jerry. That started like more than a year ago. Um, I don't and know, I, did and, I? And I'd love to connect up on that at some point because I began reading their their collective work and found it way too dense. I found it, I found I found that I should be their audience, and I was not. The hook was not in my in my in my mouth. Uh -huh. I was I was not able to get engaged in it. Yeah. The hook is in my mouth. So I'm I'm basically yeah. reading everything that Damn. she has ever written. Okay. So I even she sent me because it's only in paper a vintage book from 2000, 1900. Was it 84 uh -huh. that she wrote? The road is not a road about the open city uh, in Chile, uh -huh. which was an architectural project. So the book the cover looks like this. And the book is here, Ritoque, the, the city of Ritoque, Chile. Yeah. Um, it, it has a, a lot to do, or it's highly related to what... It, Jaime Jaime uh, introduced at the time as Bani. 
Jamais, il yeah. n'y a jamais. Mais elle est vraiment, vraiment, très profonde dans tout ça. Donc, ce que nous avons fait avec elle et avec Ham de Collective Next, vous pouvez vous souvenir que nous avons eu une commission, un assignment de by, uh, by Swift pour Cybos last year to make a basically to make an, an online event of 45 minutes uh, call it time capsule or whatever you want to call it it's a video production yeah um, <laughs> so what they had asked us or what I had suggested them to do and they accepted is we're not going to do it a, a zoom call a recorded Zoom call. What we are going to do is what we call pirate TV, which is inspired by old radio, pirate radio, uh, where you bring in new subjects, you start mixing stuff that's normally not mixed in that part, and it's it's a video production. So it, it was uh, presented as something not the normal thing that you would expect. So. All these sessions of uh, Cybos last year, which was 100% digital and also this year, they were all just standard Zoom calls. One person or two persons doing a PowerPoint presentation or having a, a fire chat conversation. And so ours was, well, uh, very, very different. So what happened is that Our session went live on, I think, 6 October last year, but we were banned from replay. <laughs> nice work. Yeah, I, I take it as a batch of honor. But, uh, <laughs> and the only explanation that we got was that it was inappropriate. Full stop. Hmm. In This is a magic word in America. Is it? Yes. So wait, the hosting organization was who again? Uh, Swift. Oh, okay. Huh. Swift and this was for the Cybers conference. Huh. Um, also Amber, uh, Amber Case. Amber Case. Uh, made us a video for, for that, that was integrated in there. And Ham did some, uh, well, in a special way, a master of ceremony. So I still have the the cut that went live, but I'm not allowed to, to distribute it. Wow. But uh, what we have agreed, Han and Amber and Anne and myself, is that we are going to redo it. Okay. So we're you, should, to... you should actually sell an NFT around the video that may, that may not be released. Yes. That's what you could do. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. That would be cool because uh, mm -hmm. it's, like, it's like behind a legal barrier, but there's actually an object there. <laughs> Uh, so that's what I'm doing these days. It took some time to get back up to speed. Uh, but to your point, it's so densely written. So what we are making out of it are uh, basically four vignettes. She calls them vignettes. And mm -hmm. she has done of some of them for uh, IFTF. They were um, in September, I think. And they're still on the IFTF site. So, but we are making basically condensed versions of the vignettes. So the vignettes were like uh, 90 minutes, I think, or 45 minutes. So we are making for each vignette 10 minute chunks, which are intended as a teaser, but not just a commercial teaser. They are uh, interesting in their own right. Each vignette has a learning in its own right. So it's value already in its own right. And we came up with a, a, a matrix. And that's also what Anne likes in our corporation. I can suddenly come up with a, a presentation that suddenly puts it in a very uh, concise way. And so we have come up with a matrix where for each vignette or of each topic, We have like four sections. One is uh, new ways of seeing. Second is new knowledge. So it's really introducing definitions of things. Like uh, what is the definition of a wicked problem? 
what is the definition of a complex adaptive system, something like that. Yeah? And then we have a section on what are the new skills you need for that and what are the new tools that exist to help you seeing in different ways. So I spent the whole day today, <laughs> I'm blocking days, where I'm going to through uh, transcripts of existing vignette um, recordings of 90 minutes. And I'm narrowing down each vignette to 1,500 words. Hmm. That should be finished by the end of this week. And then based on that, we are going to redo the recordings of Anne. Because for Swift, there was a, they sent a professional team, camera team to Los Angeles, to Anne's studio there to record her, but we can't reuse that material. Crazy. Yeah. So we are going to redo it. She, in the meantime, she moved to San Francisco. Uh, I mean, not like two months ago, but she's still in the moving process. Stuff. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. process. Uh, so we are going to record it there. Um, and Ham is going to send somebody of his team to do the actual recording. And then I'm going to edit the whole thing because because of COVID, I did have nothing else to do. I follow trainings online on Logic Pro and uh, Final Cut Pro. And I'm nice. now a, mas a master in Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro. And I make my own soundscapes and all that. But it's Isaac Newton invents the calculus during the plague. So, but else, well, there's probably other, I mean, there's some really interesting books I discovered recently. You probably can find them on my blog post. There is a side column saying Goodreads, and there are five books that I'm reading that are listed there. Uh, so one is The Book of Why, The New Science of Cause and Effect by Judy L. Pearl. Then there is Medium Design. So it's Designing Medium Media by Keller Easterling. The Pocket Guide to Action by Kyle Eschenroeder. Um, something more... <laughs> uh, uh, Fiction, well, more, it's complete fiction. Neil Stephenson's Anathem. Anathem, yeah. And then uh, The Power of Not Thinking. And I started a series, a blog series, under the common title Traveling Without Moving. And that documents more or less my journey, uh, my, my, my thinking journey since March last year. So meeting Anne Pendleton and getting into all this material and, but obviously it, it, it evolves. And so I'm adding new things in, into, into the mix. So I'm having a lot of fun. I still go regularly to uh, Musea. And I've started another series of pirate TV, which is called Art Tribe, where I'm the host and I invite a guest artist uh, to tell about their work, about a show around in their studio, what they're doing, what's driving them. Uh, there is a script for that, but we don't stick to the scripts. So the next one will be Amber Case in, his, in her uh, other identity of Clamber, where she's doing really awesome video, audio, and other work. And then I'll have my cousin, who is a senior art curator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Brussels, um, who is going to tell a story of what you didn't know about the work of a curator in a museum. And then uh, there is a filmmaker, there's a photographer, there is a, a painter. I mean, there are 
people lined up now till August. So normally, as from end April, there will be an episode of our tribe, Pirate TV, just on YouTube. It's not live, it's all pre-recorded, but my intention is to do it someday live. But then I have too many uh, devices I have to control to do it properly. And I mean, there are some good uh, live editing software there, but then I'm more with my attention with the software and then shot number one, shot number four, shot number whatever. Then I, and I'm not with the content anymore. Um, that's about it, I think. Is that all? Per, yeah, I mean, per, per my invite to this call, a bunch of slackers. Like, Dave, you missed that, like, Pete's been doing almost nothing. You know, he's had his thumb in his nose for the whole lockdown and really, yeah. You would expect nothing, nothing else from that guy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a small tragedy. Um, Peter, thank you. That's that's like remarkable. Okay. And uh, and Clamber is 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 Amber posting videos on YouTube that way, or what, where did she post uh, as her artistic identity? Because I didn't even have that in my brain. Well, she 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 likes to be uh, sort of underground. So her website, it's a public website. So it's clamber.org. Oh, that's too easy. But she tries not to mix the two identities because she has a very nice uh, assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, she's now working for Mozilla. She has a oh good. Where she's working on web monetization. She just published a blog post on Medium like two days oh. ago. It's part of a series yeah, on web monetization. Sorry, who is that you're talking about? Amber Case, uh, you want to, uh, uh, Bo or P Peter, you want to explain Amber? I met Amber through Jerry's retreat. It's a very nice anecdote. So it was the retreat, I think, of 2012. I still have the t-shirt and I still wear it. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> it's the yellow one. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's yellow. With, all, with the hand-drawn people yeah, web? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so... You, you organized or somebody organized like a car sharing to get from San Francisco airport to Marconi. Marconi, yeah. And so she was in the car next to me. I, I didn't know. So we started chatting in the car and we stayed in contact since then. So Amber. Uh, and I met Amber through Bo. So we have Bo uh -huh. to thank for the Amber connection. Thanks, Bo. So how to describe her? I mean, um, uh, you can do it. Yeah, she, she, I mean, I, I get to know her more through a book that she wrote about calm technology. Uh, and she describes herself as uh, somebody who is third generation AI in the sense that her father and the, her grandfather and so on, they were all in sort of very early AI research sort of thing. So she was born and lived all her young life because I think she's only 35 or something like that. Which seems so young right now. Yes, I mean, <laughs> I guess that it's young. I remember at one point that seems so old, but no, 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 that's youth. She, she lived, uh, I mean, she was born and lived in a computer, basically. Mm -hmm. So she's almost born as a cyborg mm -hmm. with all the pros and cons. That she, she didn't so much choose a career as like grow up in it. Yeah. She calls herself a cyborg anthropologist. You can actually yeah. you search on YouTube, you'll see lots of things from her. And if you follow oh, my, brain, my brain link, you'll see a lot of stuff. And it's not me, it's Sheldon who introduced her to had her come visit me in San Francisco, and that's when we became friends. So we oh, Sheldon. cool. Sheldon is pretty much, you know, her uh, mentor in a way. And Peter, you and Sheldon have met, right? Sheldon Raynon? No. We, I fear that, that the earth might implode if you did. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Sheldon's super interesting. I mean, I mean, super interesting. There was a brief retreat story. I don't know if any of you were there for this one. Maybe, Bo. Um, 
so at one point I wasn't sure what to do. I took everybody out to the little uh, Redwood Grove at Marconi and we sat down and I was like, let's do this now, let's not do that. And then I, someone, Nova Spivak maybe had said, uh, or someone had said, let's tell stories about how art has influenced our lives. So I'm like, let's do that. So the first person who stands up is Ray Lewis. And Ray tells a story about how his parents were both deaf. And, um, but he loved the piano, except his parents wanted him to play classical piano and blah, 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 and he loved jazz. So, and I'm, I'm barely remembering the story. I'm realizing that it's at the edges of memory. So one day he's in his room where they got him a piano. So he's playing the piano and he plays this jazz piece that he finally conquers. Like it was hard, it was a hard piece to play. And then he gets this sense that someone's around and he looks around and his mom is sitting in the corner of the room. And she signs to him, I love it when you play that. And I, I like mind blown. And he told a couple other stories like that. And then the second person to stand up is Sheldon Raynon. And Sheldon says, when I was 17, and I'm making up the numbers here, and I'm, I'm hopefully backing into the story. When I was 17, I was madly in love with a young woman, and she died all of a sudden. And three days later, I got a letter from her in the mail saying, I love you forever. I want to be with you forever. And I had a nervous breakdown. And I was institutionalized for a while. And then at my balm, my, my, the way I sort of healed from this was I started obsessively going to movies all around the New York area. So Long Island, Jersey, whatever, every movie he was just absorbed. And then he, be he becomes the center of experimental cinema in New York and did kind of the definitive coffee table book about it. Start the, started the Pacific Film Archive, I think, in San Francisco, a uh, bunch of other stuff like that. And Sheldon is a little bit like Zelig, like he's been where the action is. He's a little bit like Stuart Brand and Zelig. It's like when you look at something interesting that happened in history, Sheldon probably had a hand in it. Um, so Absolutely. super interesting. Mm -hmm. Pardon? His stories are wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he's got stories. He's got stories. Hey, uh, I would smoke pot with Nico. He didn't. What the hell? He's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, longer stories. But uh, Peter, thank you for stimulating all that. Uh, anybody else want to check in? Not at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it does. It thank does you. seem like a hard act to follow, doesn't it? I, I made coffee yesterday. Oh, was it good? Was it like... No, it wasn't Moscow particularly coffee? good, but it's caffeinated. Wow. Shit, okay. Oh, sorry to interrupt, but uh, Jamais, I'm still on the Bali thing. So you remember I was going to build a number of workshops around that? Mm -hmm. So I'm still on that. Okay. And I almost got the, the first one going on the B, or, I'm sorry, on the A, the anxious part of Bali, uh, with two people, uh, Scott's Scott, Scott, Scott Smith and um, John Wilshire, who have done a, a workshop that is really on there, but then they had to 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 pause because they got a, a big uh, client uh, mm -hmm. something, and but we are going to have contact again in in April, um, and then I would like to see again if you're interested to also do a pirate TV. Oh yeah, There's something to introduce the topic. Yeah. And Jamee looks great with a with a with a patch Arr. and a parrot. Jamee works out great. Yeah, and he speaks pirate. Yeah, you know, the, pirate. Uh, a pirate's favorite letter. You think it's R, but it, but his first love be the C. Ah, oh, that's right. That's an old joke. Yeah. Hey Susan, why did you go to London, England, and what? And now that you're back, can you catch us up? <laughs> I went to England. <laughs> because I have a friend there um, who can no longer travel. And, um, and he and I have sort of taken up a friendship after, I don't know, knowing each other for, I don't know, 30 years. <laughs> anyway, um, since I've been back, I've been uh, letting go of things. I've been letting go of, uh, some of the work I thought I wanted to do and I found I was not interested in it. And so I just put it aside. Um, and most recently, I still have plenty to do by the way, but so uh, just recently my, um, you know, my Siberians, you know that maybe some of you know that I live out in, in the woods and uh, a lovely home, lovely place, been here for 37 years. And 
um, anyway, so uh, my idea for retirement was to rent out my big house and to retire up here to, um, to the, above the garage is where I live. And um, anyway, my Siberians, uh, two Siberians here for the long term, and they recently, he got his American citizenship and she got her green card, so-called green card. I forget what they call it now. And this required celebration. And I've gotten in the habit of making some outrageous dessert for celebrations, even though I don't like making desserts and I'm not a big fan of sugar. Anyway, so for his, um, for celebrate his citizenship, I baked a, um, I thought what's terribly American. I thought a red velvet cake would do three stories high with cream cheese frosting. And then I searched the web for ridiculous sparkler things. <laughs> which I plastered all over the cake and it was wonderful. It was a mix of red, white, and blue and little white stars and big white things and all kinds of different shapes. And it was wonderful. S covered the whole cake with this and put sparklers on the top. So that was, that was, the, that was the first celebration. Um, the second celebration, which was last Sunday, was um, a, a, uh, everybody's been giving us Meyer lemons. And so it seemed that it was a good idea to make a lemon meringue pie. Now, I've made a lemon meringue pie for 50 years, I think. Um, and so I was terrified about the meringue, but it came out just fine. And uh, it was a wonderful lemon curd. And um, so we ate the whole thing in one sitting. And now I'm faced with uh, a birthday of somebody's. And um, I haven't figured out what to do. As Oh, the lemon meringue, in addition, had, um, you know, in Japan, they sometimes put gold leaf in their whiskey glass. And I bought a jar of gold leaf when I was there once. And so I sprinkled it onto the meringues, which were little peaks with little curls on the top. And in between was all this gold leaf. It was quite nice. So you have to up, one up yourself now. Well, that's what he said. Peter said, now, what are you going to do when she gets her citizenship? <laughs> I said, well, you know, something will occur to us. <laughs> um, something in an American flag pattern, maybe. Well, what I was going to do was you can get prints, right, um, of... Uh, you can make, you can get frosting, printed mm -hmm. frosting um, of just about anything. And you can get it in various different shapes. And I had planned to do her green card, but Peter didn't cooperate and give me a photograph in time. So that's always a possibility. And the other thing I've been doing is saying goodbye to many of my trees. Mm. And uh, it's very painful because of the drought, because of sudden oak death. Um, I had a large tree go down a couple of years ago that's been needed to be to have its, all the branches taken off, which I have, I don't know, uh, 20 by 20 by seven pile ready for the chipper. It breaks my heart. The, the, yeah. the trunk was, um, the trunk was nearly as tall, nearly as wide as I am tall. <laughs> I mean, I could do like this, right? Standing next to it, it was oak. Mm. And when you cut down an old oak like that, there is a terrific smell. Um, and I didn't know what the smell was and I thought that must be the wood and of course it is. I'd never smelled the oak wood before, mm. so fresh. So, and I'm reading, of course I'm reading, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, I was reading Isabel Wilkerson's cast. Mm. And then I discovered that Arundhati Roy, who wrote The God of Small Things and a number of other, other things, had written a, um, where is that? Uh, here. No, that's Lake off. Anyway, um, she had wrote, written an essay on, the, on uh, Gandhi and um, that's why I need the book because I need to remember the Ambed Ambedkar, um, who was um, when uh, they were the Indi you know when England was tearing up 
Southeast Asia. Um, she wrote, she just recently wrote this piece and got out the old speeches of the two of them arguing for, for and against um, the cast of Untouchable, which makes a nice, and I, um, the author of Cat, Isabel Wilkerson did not cite her, although maybe she was, maybe, maybe Arundhati was writing it at the same time that is she the was book, writing her is book. the book. Susan, is the book titled The Doctor and the Saint? Yeah. Uh, cast Race and the Annihilation of Caste, the debate between B.R. Yeah. Ambedkar and, M K and Mohandas K. Gandhi. Yes, and cool. it's, it's quite stunning. Um, I'm reading it slowly because, because it's the sort of thing I read slowly, but. Uh, Super interesting. Yeah. And when you go back and read <laughs> and read it and you wonder, you know, Gandhi becomes as as anyone of any note does, <laughs> becomes less less impressive and um and Bedkar becomes more impressive in his thinking. Um yeah. yeah. I mean uh -huh. I'm quite taken with Isabel's argument that caste and class and all of these other things are, are um, you know, of, of, a, of a kind and, uh, and how they come to be. And my interest in social cohesion goes way back um, and uh, what makes it and how you maintain it and what's it good for and what's it bad for and all the rest of that stuff. So it's just interesting to see, to rethink those dynamics. I don't have anything insightful to say about it yet. Thank you for pointing us to it. It's really cool. I just posted a link to a, a New Yorker article that I think is the reason I know about this book because it, it mentions a whole bunch of books uh, that are related to the topic of caste and, uh, and so forth in India. And so the, 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 the article is titled Gandhi for the Post-Truth Age. I think it's by Pankaj Mishra, um, but it points to a whole bunch of books that I put in. So the Impossible Indian Gandhi and the Temptation of Violence, the South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, The Origins yeah. of Totalitarianism, The Moral Economists, Tawny Polanyi Thompson and a Critique of Capitalism, mm -hmm. the, Indi the Indian Ideology, Gandhi, The Years That Changed the World, so a biography of Gandhi. All of those are pointed to in Isn't this that? article I just pasted. Yeah. Okay. All this stuff is just so damned fascinating. I know, I, I, and it gets even more as you go on. Yeah, yeah. And I spent a, uh, an hour this morning researching the Franco-Prussian, the conclusion of the Franco-Prussian War and the indemnity that France was, was forced to pay uh, and how that was one of the causes of World War I. And, and, and like, like, you know, war reparations in general, like how do they work and who has had to pay them? And the, the worst one ever was uh, the, per, the Treaty of Paris 1815, I think, when France was forced to pay 700 million francs, which was a whole lot of money back then, which was like 20% of GDP. Mm. And I think it was when they lost, I'm, I'm, now I'm confusing my wars, but I think it's when they, when they lost to Bismarck uh, and Bismarck set, was, was quoted to have said, uh, the only way to keep these French from attacking us again is to keep them too poor uh, to worry about like war. Hence the, hence the, the whopping uh, penalty and the French being really proud basically socialized the debt, bought up bonds like crazy and paid it off two years early. Mm. And, and that provokes a big industrial boom in France and France's economy suddenly like flourishes. Like all, all, all this shit never works the way the policymakers wanted to. Wasn't there a big debt after the Haitian independence that like it saddled the Haitians with huge debt forever that's kind of been blamed for? Yep. Yep, for the poverty in Haiti and other sorts of stuff. Agreed. And then the famous one is the Treaty of Versailles after World War I, which saddles Germany with debt. And then a backstory there that needs fact-checking. But, but basically, British foreign policy has always more or less been, we don't want there to ever be one big power on the continent. Because whenever one of the powers gets out of balance and gets really big, the next thing they want to do is invade us. So they're always playing the powers off against each other. And at the end of World War I, who's the big power? France, because Germany is just a total shambles and France is recovering and they penalize and the Treaty of Versailles penalizes Germany enormously, kind of to cripple them too. Um, and so any debt payments that Germany makes after World War I were financed by the Brits. 
the Brits basically lent them the money to go pay the French. We did too. American banks were big time into it. Yeah, yeah. So the German reconstruction and the rebuilding of the Wehrmacht and all those good things. And if anybody hasn't watched the series Babylon Berlin, <laughs> like please watch Babylon Berlin. It's uh, it's on Netflix. It's uh, it's five years five years of series now, I think. And uh, you must binge watch. It's beautiful because it's a crime drama. It's a police fiction. It's a police drama. It's politic. It's like a major geopolitical thing going on in the background. Uh, a tiny plot spoiler. At one point, deep into season three, our hero is basically sent on an airplane flight, which is like vomit-inducing, to go scout uh, an airbase, which is in Russia. And basically, the Russians allowed the Germans to build an airbase to train their pilots, who were then used in the Spanish Civil War and then in World War uh, World War II, uh, to get around the restrictions for an air force in Germany. And so there's this black Wehrmacht, sort of the, the, the black military uh, of Germany that, that turns into, when by the time Hitler comes to power, the German army is one of the best trained, smartest uh, armies there's ever been. Like it's, it's like a brilliant military separate from Hitler. He did not conceive it or make it. But the sure. German military, the German military that, that meets up with Hitler is one of the best militaries there's ever been. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, all kinds of crap. Uh, Jamey, did you want to check in any more? All this stuff that's going on for you? I have a question no, for I... Jamey. That's oh. a question for Jamey from the audience. Yes, please. Yes. Yes. I don't know if um, I'm watching with some alarm and perhaps, um, and I would like you to um, illuminate <laughs> the whole um, China and Taiwan thing and all the ships. Um, I mean, all the, uh, the air flights and everything else. I mean, is this I mean, I'm sure you have a view on what's going on there. What is going on there? Um, I, I think that uh, to a degree, Xi Jinping is trying to uh, distract from some pretty ser serious in, uh, internal economic problems um, and just riding high on the waves, waves of nationalism that have been hitting in China and um, and looking to make his mark. Um, I'm, I don't think that we're going to see an actual invasion attempt, but you know. And what, I, what are we going to do if there is one? And yeah. yeah. Um, would we be willing to, in, to hit back um, as is our stated or I don't know if it's at this point if it's a stated or simply implied policy. Mm. Uh, I can't recall. And just to complicate matters, Putin is busy building up troops right outside the Ukraine at the yep. same moment. Mm -hmm. yep. They're just trying to give Biden a hard time. So we could have a two front war against Russia and China in yeah. principle. Yeah. yeah, and that's one yeah. of those things. Not that, that we like to pick on big yeah. bullies. Right. Well, you know, and it's one of those things that there is no right or good answer for if china were to invade taiwan if you know russia were to just attempt to fully take on you know, take over ukraine um hitting back militarily would be suicidal or potentially it seems so. like and not doing anything would be um extremely problematic uh, would, yeah. would be yeah. devastating uh, to uh, to Amer to the American economy to the American to whatever is left of our standing in the world as a you know, potential leader um, or even someone that can be trusted mm -hmm. um, and I think that both uh, Xi and Putin know that and I think Putin's more likely to act than she is mm -hmm. simply mm -hmm. because um, Putin has really has, has done doesn't have a lot to lose. He's done it before, doesn't have a lot to lose. Um, right. Whereas uh, China would almost certainly face some kind of serious economic um, reaction globally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm 
I haven't been watching too closely because I already have a big enough ulcer. Um, it just mostly I'm so disappointed mm. in the world. Um, so I'm not a good yeah. person to ask right now. Um, also, what about the Belt and Road Initiative? Do you know about that, Susan, and what the, the, the Chinese are doing? It's, I do know about that. And you know that, that they're using the money that they used to buy U.S. Treasury bonds to do that. I didn't know that. So they're I didn't not, know that part either. So uh -huh. they're not, what they're doing is they're not playing the nicey nice with the American economy and, power, and the petrodollar. And uh, so they're taking all that money and loaning it. And you realize if anybody defaults, well, then China you know, repossesses your infrastructure. <laughs> oh, it's a brilliant scheme. Yeah, and it, oh. from what I can tell, the various nations that China China is investing in have very mixed feelings at best about yeah. it. You know, they want the money, they want the investment, but really don't like what comes along with it. And this um, is a game the British Imperium played too of loaning money yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. This is good old imperialism oh. done Bankers. by the Communist Party. <laughs> yeah, bankers have played a huge role in all these wars. I would I would not want to be. Um, no, it looks so gleeful. Yeah, uh, exactly. I'm sorry not, if it's intelligent. I kind of respect it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would not want to be on any of the aircraft carriers of the Seventh Fleet or whatever fleet we have swimming around near the South China Sea. Like, like if any if anything hot starts, you're done. You're done. A super done. missile takes you out. You're done. Yeah. yeah. I, I would not want to be there. I, and, I understand in our war games, they keep having to sort of rejigger them because aircraft carriers always get hit. Well, yeah, um, there's, there's this very there's a very famous guy named uh, Van, Paul Van Riper, <clears throat> and he completely fucked up uh, a, a red team exercise way back when a war game, uh, and what he did was he had messages sent by messengers on motorcycles, and then he had really tiny boats basically uh, loaded with explosives, but thousands upon thousands of them go up and sidle up next to the ships of the fleet and destroy the fleet every time, and so they had to stop the exercise. They they forbade him from breaking the rules. And they sort of went back to business as usual. But but he just went, you know, he went outside the rules and destroyed us with really cheap, uh, really cheap, simple, simple technologies. A, a separate way of looking at the, the, the China question. A long time ago in undergrad, somebody talked about Dake Plus and Peri Plus, which were uh, military tactics from the Greek galleys. And uh, uh, one of them is basically a defensive strategy where you put all your galleys, all your galleys, you line up your galleys tail end together so that they form spikes outward. And if anybody's around you, you just you attack and you attack really hard. Anytime there's a tiny attempt to attack you, you strike back harder, which okay. was explained as Israel's defensive strategy in the Middle East to me. And then periplus is the opposite. Periplus, I think, is when you're outside sort of trying to attack in. But and then combine that with uh, when Napoleon marches into Russia, the Russian army can't hold them back because they're way the Poles are way outnumbered, the Russians are way outnumbered. So what they do, because they understand that Napoleon's army uh, eats uh, the, eats from what it can scavenge from territories it's occupying, they do the scorched earth strategy. They basically burn everything so that there's nothing edible left in Napoleon's path. And Napoleon reach, reaches Moscow, takes Moscow, and then leaves. And famously, like only 20,000 soldiers are left out of 400,000 that went in. So success at, at tremendous cost. But can, if you were Taiwan, you know, I, I wonder what's going through Audrey Tang's head right now. If you were Taiwan, what could you do? Is there, is there a way you can turn yourself into a puffer fish so that if you're ingested by the enemy fish, you blow yourself up and you, they, like, they have to spit you back out. Like, what could you possibly do? Could you make yourself somehow inedible or could you just destroy everything so that, so that if they're going to come take you over, well, screw you, we're not going to leave anything. Those are, those are two like dramatically different kind of alternatives. But if I were, if I were in charge of Taiwan and trying to figure out strategies, I'd be trying to figure out, I'd be figuring out a puffer fish plan somehow. Make yourself toxic, make yourself painful uh, so that they can't actually ingest you. Because one of the coolest things about Audrey Tang and the democracy movement in Taiwan is that it's a model that we should be following. Like, like Taiwanese democracy is more interesting and better rooted and has more to do with citizens and is, it treats its citizens better and is better seen um, by Taiwanese than almost any democracy on earth that I can think of. Like it's super powerful, super strong, super interesting. And it's, it's the one that's maybe probably going to be ingested by China. 
they needed exactly something they can ride down out of the clouds. <laughs> but what what would you do, right? I mean, they have to remember to tell people they've got it, though. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Maybe a movie. Maybe they could shoot a movie with Peter Sell. Ah, shit, he's dead. Um, well, there's always uh, Sasha Baron Cohen, who has announced that he's giving up doing any more Borat movies or or actually any more of that style of filmmaking because he came too close to being killed in making the last Borat movie. I bet, I bet he really pushes it. I mean, the idea that they go into the Republican, the 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 Republican, not the Republican convention, but the other the other meeting. And parade around in a in a Trump outfit with Pence over his shoulder or whatever it was. Oh, wait, with the the younger with the young lady over his shoulder. That's they, right. I have woman for you. Like, wow, that takes. I don't know what that takes, but just in chutzpah. chutzpah, chutzpah, cojones. I'm kind of actually. I'm a little bit where the China, the Taiwan thing is. I think an example. I'm curious a little bit. Are other people doing this? Jimmy, I'm just assuming that you're like in a boom time for your business because it seems to me that. I'm going back to, okay, well, what's the next massive crisis, right? You know, is it going to be like this, this volcano that's gone off in the Caribbean kind of, or, you know, it's like, oh, maybe I should prepare for a California earthquake or, you know, I, I'm spending a much more time, I think, thinking about some kind of crisis than I would have, you know, pre-pandemic basically, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, and maybe it's because of like Trump and then the pandemic, you have, you know, crisis on top of it. It's like, like, well, what's the next one? You know, what's next season going to bring? And, and, and I'm thinking, right. Shemaine, there's an opportunity here for you to have a pirate TV show called Crisis Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> um, Wheel of Misfortune. Yeah, well, yeah. And you um, can play, you can play Carmina Burana every time. Well, why isn't it the climate, which is changing I mean, you know, Siberia is sort of melting. Uh, so is the Arctic. Greenland, Greenland's melting. Yeah. And, um, and one, one thing I noticed in England was, and nobody seemed alarmed, which is I was very alarmed. Um, they had predicted this might happen was that, that the Gulf Stream would slow down. So there's so much, mm -hmm. wa you know, water melt in the coming down off of Greenland that it's pushing the, um, it's not it's making it's, the whole it's, thing. It's stopping, it's stopping the- It's stopping. And so they're very cold and they haven't figured out that this isn't going to go away. And by the way, if Greenland melts, it's a 20 foot worldwide sea level rise. Yeah, and it's happening fast. Just just Greenland. Yeah. Yeah. Never well, mind there, Antarctica. There was some really, really interesting research done a few years ago that i am been looking on the lookout for, for follow-up research that how fast would a sea level rise that came from you know greenland or antarctica how fast would that propagate because it's not it's not going to be a case of you know, the, uh, the it goes into the water it goes to the ocean and the oceans all rise immediately it has to propagate and that's and that is shaped by currents yes and that propagation shape and the research showed that it would actually take on you know it would actually take close to a year for a, a rapid Greenland melt to actually have an, have an impact. And that there were some scenarios of an Antarctic melt that got trapped in the Antarctic Ocean. Ah, yes. Uh, and but I only saw the one paper and I haven't found any follow-up on it. So it's- so the, so the logic there is that sea level rise within the Atlantic bounding countries would be much sharper than 20 feet or whatever the estimates would be? Um, it could be, could be sharper, but also be slower. Yeah. Well, yeah. slow. Well, slower propagation means much worse within the area where the trap is happening. Right. I, I'm I'm saying if the propagation were slowed up by this trap you described, then as assuming Greenland keeps melting quickly. Yeah. So it would be it would be worse around Greenland. But what I'm saying is that people would. I tend to look at these things through a political filter of how do people react to something like this. New York You've been told to us this, this disaster is happening. Yeah. And then, you know, it actually doesn't seem too bad. Yeah, it's a pandemic, is it? Well, I don't know anybody who's sick. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the uh, the wild card that I'm most uh, um, attuned to is um, the island of La Palma in the Canary Islands. Um, it's the Canary in the coal mine, so to speak. Well, it is a um, sorry, Dave. I'm sorry, precarious, Dave. Precarious. 
you can weep softly. It's a precarious rock. It's a precarious rock. Basically, it will at some point in the geologically near future uh, collapse into the ocean and cause something on the order of a 200 foot uh, tidal wave. Well, I haven't the, heard this uh, one yet. Come on, hitting seriously? Hitting the East Coast. Uh, yeah, so it's La Palma Island in the Canary Islands. Um, it, is ge it is geologically active. Um, and there, no one's quite sure how much of a shake it will take to ha cause half the island to slide off into the ocean and basically wipe out the east coast of the Americas. Damn. Well, good um, thing. That, good thing the first link that shows up on Google is a tourism link because they're going to need that real yeah. quick. Well, it's one of those things that you can't predict it. I mean, or you, it's at least currently not predictable. We know that it is just from our understanding of geology. We know that it's going to happen at some point. It could take <laughs> a big shock. It could take a bunch of little shocks. Um, and so that's my that's my my favorite wild card because what can you do about it? It's just. I'm sorry, I'm not in a good mood for this today. Uh, right. I'll sit here and listen to no. everyone else being really accomplished, and I'm going to. I'll, I'll sit back and just sort of. You're think accomplished. About my that I, I peaked. I peaked a number of years ago, but. So has anybody read the um, uh, Ministry of the Future? I started. The, I the started new KSR it. Book. I started it. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson. I started it and found it boring. Like, like, like I found the start totally predictable and boring. Like, okay, these bunch of people have to live in air conditioning all the time. These bunch of people are suffering, and I didn't get deep enough into it to for it to like grab me either. So I should because um, it seems it seems to be well done. Have you seen, have you read other KSR books? Other yeah. of, of his books? Yeah, he, the, some he's... of the Mars Mars trilogy and a couple other things. Yeah, he's a um, very um, bureaucratic writer if you want to yeah. read 100 pages yeah. on the creation of the new mars constitution it's there for you in uh in uh green mars um well he's a wonk. he's a he's a wonk yeah yeah uh, kind of with, kind i shook of his hand once sorry what yes i met i shook, shook his hand once at a conference <laughs> look yeah. here david david are you still in vermont or are you back on the west where are you Back in Oakland. Yeah. He's in La Palma waiting for the volcano exactly. to go Exactly. I'm, I'm <laughs> going to spend my time on the West Coast from now on, though. Thank <laughs> you for that warning, Jim. <laughs> uh, well, uh, sort of in the spirit of checking in, and I have, I have to switch calls at the, at the half hour mark, so we're going to have to wrap on time, which is what we usually do, I guess. But Peter, thank you for connecting me to Hamilton which turned into a conversation with Matt Saia of Collective Next, which turned into a year of working, building, doing stuff with Open Global Mind, which I've been working on, which in the last couple of weeks has been through a bit of an existential crisis. Um, and so we have been heading uh, directly toward uh, a structure called steward ownership that I think I mentioned on a previous call here. Uh, steward ownership is, a, is, a, is an organizational form, right? There's many. And this one uh, is, is meant to be a durable form that is good to the earth. So the steward ownership basically, well, thank you. Um, so steward ownership basically has a nonprofit. And in the US, that means a 501c3 that owns all of the shares of a for-profit, like a C-Corp. And what it does, and I don't like either the 501c3 or the C-Corp uh, models very much. But what this does is it harnesses the rapacious nature of your C-Corp into the public good because it has to follow the dictates of what the nonprofit wants, which is like the benefit of humanity. So, and then the good news is that these two structures are incredibly well-known, well-grooved in American culture, law, uh, uh, economy. <clears throat> so, so these are very stable, you know, uh, entities that, that, that you can then use to build a foundation to pour open source, con you know, code and data into the commons. You could build a for benefit on top of this. You could kind of use this as a platform. The idea so I, I made, uh, I, was, I, was, um, I was on a call five months ago and a guy after the call pings me, his name is Jordan, and he says, hey, um, we, I'd love to talk to you. I, love, I like what you said on the call. He has spent the last five years researching and then finding and then trying to create a way to bring lots of entities into the steward ownership model. So he's trying to build an ecosystem of steward owned companies 
uh, that then can help one another because they have different kinds of skills and capacities that, that then can build something out. And, and I thought this was pretty cool and we've been working really hard on it. And just, I think uh, today's Wednesday, just yesterday on the coordinating call for this, uh, a few of us were like, we need to, we need to hit pause. Uh, partly because Open Global Mind was really having like high speed wobbles. Um, so, and, and uh, this, is, this is, you know, not information out yet. So I'm, we're gonna have this conversation tomorrow. Uh, so don't go blog it right now, but, but it's been a really educational, uh, really kind of difficult journey and a bunch of other stuff. But in the meantime, like that's what, I, that's most of what I've done for the last year. So revenues are awful. Uh, I have a couple tiny gigs right now that are kind of like keeping the, the heartbeat going, but I now need to sort of like pause, build some inside stuff for open global mind better worry about diversity and open global mind because there's way too many white guys. Um, and go worry about my own revenues for a while and try to get some speeches and other sorts of things, um, which I haven't done for a while. But um, but OGM is this lovely thing that keeps getting more and more interesting. And Pete Kaminsky is like nostril deep in it. He is kind of the Scotty and Data and Uhura of, of OGM all at once. Um, and... Uh, and I get to, which means I get to sort of co-work with him all, you know, all the time. And, and he started inventing something, which is a, something I've had as a wish list item for a really long time, which I can explain in like, in like a minute. Uh, so he's, of course, Mr. Wiki. He was one of the co-founders of Social Text, which was a wiki company that sold wikis to enterprises. So he's always got wiki on his brain. And then we had this conversation about um, how could we separate the data from the wiki and from other tools so that the data is reusable. And uh, are you all familiar with Markdown? So enough nods, no. So markup, hypertext, uh, HTML is the hypertext markup uh, language, right? And, mark, and hypertext markup can get pretty complicated and it's not easily human readable after a very short while. In response, a bunch of people started writing in Markdown, which means when I hit, when I hit a hash mark and put something, it, that means make it a first level title. Two hash marks is a second level title, blah, blah, blah. A dash and then a sentence means make this a bullet. <clears throat> and then, there's a, and then a four dashes means put a horizontal rule across the page. So Markdown is really, really simple writing. And you can write in Markdown and then, and then see it made, made beautiful you know, uh, in, in some other sort of tool. It's, it, it's sort of an alternative to what you see is what you get, you know, just what, which, which we're used to in Word, you know, Google Docs and all that. But what it buys you is this incredibly simple file format, which then, so imagine that I've got a bio, there's a page called Jerry Mikulski in a wiki, awesome. That same page could show up as a presentation page in something that's like a PowerPoint killer. So there's a whole bunch of little, little presentation apps that love Markdown. And what you do is you create a Markdown file or several Markdown files, and, and then you point to them and those each become pages in your presentation. And when you say present them, the same set of pages get formatted, the, the text gets bigger because it's a presentation, you blow off all the menus, you put a le left and right arrow in so that you can toggle through the rest of your presentation. It's nowhere near as powerful as PowerPoint, but um, that same page could then be a page on a website with a, with a static site generator, which is a way of building pages out of simple things like Markdown. That same page could be in a brain. Mm. And part of what we've done in the Free Jerry's Brain subgroup of Open Global Mind is first, you know, use the export function in the brain to create a big pile of JSON, which is a data format that's more complicated than Markdown. So we've got my brain exported at, at, a, at a point a couple months ago. We can do it again. But, but how do we then start modeling this um, at, so that the same, so that we start to disengage all these different ways of seeing apps and data from the data itself, which becomes this layer of hopefully linked, trustworthy, contextualized data so that when Bo using Kumu addresses some node and updates the data, I using the brain will get updated data in my brain view, for example, right? Uh, and so we should just sell, sell NFTs on this? Is that what you're saying, Jermaine? Yeah, NFT, NFTs are ultimately come down to it. It's just basically a cryptographically signed the, 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 the solution to everything, right? Well, then, actually, I don't think they're quite, uh, aside from the whole um, proof of work uh, environmental disaster aspect. Yes, well, there is that. Um, there is that, that little thing. Um, the concept of NFTs doesn't really strike me as outrageous because it's essentially giving, you know, giving a, um, a, a, a believable signature. 
on something. It's, it's not just here's this drawing and everybody loves this drawing, everybody has a copy of it. And this is a signed Picasso lithograph. You know, and I can have that a copy of it on my wall. It's not unique in that respect, but it's just one I have a signature for. It. Uh -huh. And that's what, as far as I can understand it, that's what an NFT is. Except it's a signature that if I were to sell that lithograph to somebody else, Picasso gets a cut because he's maintaining that level of ownership of it. Which is awesome. So I, 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 aside, again, aside from the whole environmental disaster part, actually, I think NFTs are kind of interesting. Yeah, me too. Appealing. Uh, so I'm I'm exactly in that in that ambivalence. So on the one hand, there's a there's an environmental disaster brewing in all of these blockchain related um, crypto things. But on the other hand, so one of the artists who sold an NFT baked into the smart contract that's inside the NFT, not just 10% back to the artist, which is becoming customary in art, art NFTs, but also a flow of cash to all the people who worked in her studio on the day this thing was sold. And you could build, because it's a smart contract, there's a language called Lexon. Anybody familiar with Lexon or Solid um, or Solidify, I think? There, so Lexon is a human readable legal language that is also machine readable. So it, it, they found this sort of middle ground where you can make a very explicit contract that, that is crisper than prose. Yeah, and, and it's really cool. So imagine you can then start baking community support, uh, support for the commons, other kinds of things into an NFT contract. And then as it appreciates some hunk of that new money at each, at each further sale, is coming back into and fueling the art market or the art, you know, art community. I, I, I'm like, this is great. And then the third piece of this that's really difficult is that now that NFTs are available and the technology is widely distributed, everybody and their uncle wants to launch an NFT, which means the market is going to get completely polluted, which basically means buyer beware and also might mean the collapse of the whole thing because there's just too much of it, right? So it, it, might, it might just be that, that, that everybody poisons it by, by launching an NFT on everything. But, but I totally understand why somebody would have paid $500,000 for um, uh, Wurzel's article about NFTs in a snapshot. Like that is a memorable event in the history of NFTs and you want that one. That one's gonna be valuable, right? And Beeple's famous, you know, uh, famous one is gonna be valuable. I don't know if it's gonna go that much beyond 69, $66 million, but still. I, don't know, I, I think that there is this this proliferation of them, and it will probably end up um, whittling over time, whittling down to being the equivalent of, you know, equivalent of a signed lithograph, you know, it, it, you know, for for digital art primarily. But but it's uh, already it's, it's already so different from a, a digital lithograph, and and also in 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 the art world, you have this insane problem of forgeries and fakes. Like you're never really quite sure you have that Monet. Right. Never really well, quite sure. And here well, you can actually be sure unless somebody screwed up the wallet and lost it, but then it's lost. Right. Well, that, that, but that's my point that, that it will become, you know, with all of these different experiments with it, great. See what it fits with. Yeah. You know, just don't destroy the planet. Um, but once they figure out Please. the, the uh, proof of, um, I forget what the other one is, not proof, proof of work, proof of, I'm sorry? Steak. Yeah. Um, once they figure that out, then, yeah. It will be a, a hard to refute. You know, that's actually the forgery. I'm thinking. Uh, what occurred to me was baseball cards. Yeah. There's a big problem with forgeries of signatures on baseball cards because right. that that's why so many of the, if you were to buy a baseball card, you, it comes with a photograph of the of the player signing the card. And, um, and NBA is already selling NFTs of different plays, for better or worse. So that kind of thing, I can totally see this model surviving. Yeah. But it, just, I don't know if you noticed on the chat, you're crisper than prose. And I know that you used the comparative than and yeah. crisper with an E. Yeah, yeah. But just the crisper than prose in that context just that made me think, you know, how would you apply that kind of model to yeah. um, I like that. genetic engineering? Could you yeah. have a, a cryptographically signed gene tweak? Um, so, so basically, uh, Moderna, the scientists could base could, uh, could autograph the sequence they got when they figured out that they'd cracked the code on the COVID vaccine, and they could sell that as an NFT. And or that might be, and, and that's just a really primitive pass at what you what you're thinking about here. Yeah, because I'm thinking something along the lines of 
I want to guarantee that this is the Moderna and not a, um, a knockoff. Oh, just as an authentication mechanism. So it could be an authentication mechanism, could yeah, be yeah. a signature. It could be, and Proof this of is origin. Where, as it doesn't surprise you, this is where my mind goes. It could be a way of blocking out um, illicit copies, such as having an unauthorized copy in your kit. Mm -hmm. So I, you have to basically pay for reproduction rights to, to uh, pass along this genetic tweak. Oh, good, good. So now you'd have to like apply, buy a license to, to have a baby. Mm -hmm. Gattaca, welcome to Gattaca. Go ahead, Susie. That's remarkable. Well, I'm just agreeing. I like that. You like Gattaca? No, I, li I like the idea of licensing. I mean, I really think that's cool. We need that now. Any, uh, any other check-ins or thoughts? We've got a few minutes left. I got a question. This may be a good group to ask. I'm just, I was trying to know more about like the history and design of like the WordPress ecosystem. Um, Cause it seems like I, it might be a good model for other kinds of open spacey collaborative revenue and generating, you know, things. The next um, model. But I don't really know the details very well. Have you read anything or? I, I don't know too much more than just like the evident stuff. Um, and I tried for, I think, 15 years to love WordPress and ended up just hating it. So I've left it entirely. But there's a whole ecosystem of companies that sell themes and that will build WordPress sites and so forth. Same thing with Drupal, same thing with a couple other sort of open source code bases that work differently from each other. Uh, but there's a, there's a whole bunch of, of communities like this. And I think open source communities in general are a very nice business model here because there's, there's code in the commons and then there's businesses making a living from nurturing the code in the commons and everybody benefits from the code staying in the commons and getting better over time. That's, yeah. that's, a, that's a dynamic I'm trying to replicate. I, I yeah, heard so. him in a, in a podcast and he was a fascinating guy and uh, they also have a global team. So basically they can work around the clock they have very specific sort of ways that the teams work together and they have a very interesting culture actually. So um, I think they're well worth looking at for building an organization. Anybody else know anything about WordPress ecosystem? And uh, Dave, we've got a catch up call about uh, regenerative ag stuff with via Klaus with OGM and all that coming up. Uh, I'm just really interested in what you and Hodgson and everybody else have been up to and what it's shaping into and and all of that, so. Yeah, it'd be fun, it'd be fun. Well, and actually I've been reading, I don't know that the uh, innovation broker stuff that Klaus was sharing is really interesting. Um, I don't know if you've looked at it much, but. I've looked at it some a and, bit of research, but... I, and I told him up front, I was really turned off by, by the words innovation broker, but the idea is really, really good. Like, like, like the moment it was called innovation broker, I'm like, ah, oh, crap, broker's in the middle of innovation. Um, uh, but that's not really what he means. That's not the intention of it, so. Um, so I think we're, we're into it. And Klaus is really interesting. This guy's uh, Klaus Mager. He's, a, he's a, an important member in the Open Global Mind community. Uh, he, for years, w ran uh, food facilities at Disney. And so when Disney Asia opened, it was his job to go like create all the food behind the scenes for Disney Asia, for, for example. Uh, I'm forgetting which one, probably the Macau or something like that. I don't remember which one. But uh, and then he went and worked for a German chain doing food service. And then he had a, he had a, I'm getting close to retirement age. I need to do something significant moment. And then shifted entirely out of the industry and has been trying to change the food system toward regenerativity, which to me, to me, the benefits of this are like a no brainer because regenerative ag has like five different awesome mutually reinforcing side benefits. Like people get employed, the earth gets richer, the earth soaks up more carbon, uh, crops are healthier. Like, like, like there's all kinds of really good spill out from regenerative ag, um, but the industry and its structures and profit models and all that sort of lie in the way. Um, and, and so how to, how to get past that, I think is a, is a huge piece here. I just put the podcast in, David, about WordPress, and it's the founder, and he talks about Genesis and building the culture. And oh, cool. They should do a Guy Raz interview with him about how I built this. That would be a really good story. 
Yeah, the question, you know, that's the, the question is kind of like, how do you, like, I, I don't want software to be the asset necessarily. You know, I want to, you know, it seems like you want a core asset around which things develop. Um, and I feel like, you know, with GRC kind of, you've got an, an active ecosystem of people who are probably willing to co-create in some sense, but like, how do you kind of link that, get the assets started and the ecosystem started and then, you know, have the managing system happening at this, you know, I mean, like, how does that happen? So. Agreed. Well, cool. Well, um, I'm happy spring is here. We're all going good. So yeah, so Isn't far so good. Anybody vaccinated? Raise your hands. I got my first, got my second on the 22nd. I have, I have none. Nice. I have both. Awesome. I'm not even in the queue. We're like April and I are waiting to be told, but, but the deadline in Oregon is like, we should be, we should be uh, approved right soon. I mean, we don't qualify for any of the lists that can go get a vaccine. Are you on the Oregon website thing and everything? Yeah, it's really crappy, but we are. I was one of the people they mistakenly allowed in. Oh, perfect. And they apologized, oh. but I still could do it. And I'm like, you damn right, I'm doing it. Sounds good, <laughs> of course. Awesome. Well, ho hopefully next call, we've all had like a couple of vaccines. That would be great. And I think it's a really worth the conversation. Well, uh, the the emotional relief that some people say they have when they've got it is just outrageous. I mean, it's just off the scale. Apparently, a whole lot of people cry after they get vaccinated. Yeah, I definitely then, had emotional relief. I definitely had it. Yeah. yeah, and then you immediately stop start worrying about collapsing islands. So you know. Yeah, yeah. Which I'm going to go worry about There's now. A yin and a yang. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jerry. Until thank you, soon. Bye, <laughs> bye. Bye.